In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to calculate heat for phase changes and temperature changes. Remember, with this heating curve, we have three temperature changes, and two phase changes. We will have an equation that we'll use for temperature changes and an equation that we'll use for phase changes. And you can also apply these to cooling curves. Before we talk about these calculations, let's talk about specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. Each substance has its own unique specific heat capacity, so this could be a way that you identify substances, just like if you looked at the density or the melting point or the boiling point. Specific heat capacities will always be positive values, so if you're ever calculating a specific heat capacity and you have a negative value, you missed a sign somewhere. Because specific heat capacity involves heat, temperature, and mass, uh, the units are a little more complicated. Joules per gram per degree Celsius, abbreviated here. You're probably already familiar with the degree Celsius in the gram. The joule might be new. This is our unit that we use for energy, and it's abbreviated with a capital J. Specific heat capacity is a physical property, um, meaning that you can observe specific heat capacity for a substance without changing the identity of that substance just like density, and it's also an intensive property, just like density. Uh, no matter how much you have of a particular substance, its specific heat capacity is constant. The sheet you received in class has some specific heat capacities for just a few substances. This is by no means inclusive, but uh, it just gives you an idea of uh, some different values for specific heat capacities. Uh, notice the units again of joules per gram per degree Celsius. It is not necessary for you to memorize these specific heat capacity values. It is good for you to know that the specific heat capacity of water is extremely high, 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So for temperature changes, if you know the specific heat capacity for a substance, and you know its mass, and you know the change in temperature that it experiences, you can actually calculate the amount of heat that would be released or absorbed during a temperature change. If you remember from earlier, heat depends on both the speed of the particles, that would be your temperature, and um, the mass of the particles due to the collection of particles that you have. And so it should make sense that we see mass and uh, temperature change uh, in the equation, Q equals mc delta T. Q is for heat. I know that doesn't seem like an obvious matchup, but that's what it is. M is for mass, C is for specific heat capacity, and delta T is for the change in temperature. We can't measure heat directly, we have to calculate it. So for a temperature change, Q equals mc delta T is your equation. Please always calculate delta T with the final temperature first and the initial temperature second. When we do this, we can get positive or negative values for Q. This is acceptable. Whenever we have a temperature decrease where heat is transferred out of the system, Q will be negative. The final temperature will be lower than the initial temperature. And whenever we have heat absorbed, Q will be positive, so this is a temperature increase where your final temperature is higher than your initial temperature. Let's look at a sample problem where we need to use Q equals MC delta T. We're going to calculate the heat that must be released to cool 56 grams of copper from 22.5 degrees Celsius to negative 9 degrees Celsius. We see uh, a mention of a temperature change here and we want to calculate heat, so that uh, should lead us to think about Q equals MC delta T. We're going to solve for heat for Q. The mass is 56 grams. The specific heat capacity we need to look up on the sheet that you were given in class 
Copper's element symbol is Cu, and the specific heat capacity is 0.385 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And then for the delta T, final minus initial, so negative 9 minus 22.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, so 56 times 0.385 times the difference here of negative 31.5 degrees Celsius. When we go around our answer, we're not going to use the specific heat capacity for sig figs. We're just going to use the data, so the 56 or the negative 31.5. And since we're multiplying, we're going to go with three sig figs, and we get negative 679. And then the units would be joules, because we're calculating heat. Uh, basically, in specific heat capacity, um, it's joules per gram, so the grams would cancel, per degree Celsius, so the degree Celsius would cancel, and that will leave you with just joules. And we do want to make sure that we have this value negative because heat is being released and we're seeing a temperature decrease. For phase changes, we cannot use Q equals MC delta T to calculate the amount of heat that's released or absorbed. There's no temperature change during phase changes, if you remember. Uh, so if we have a delta T of zero, that would give us a, a Q value of zero, and that just doesn't make sense. However, we can calculate the amount of heat released or absorbed during phase changes. We're going to use either the heat of fusion or the heat of vaporization. It just depends on the phase change. So if we're talking about freezing or melting, we're going to use the heat of fusion. And this is just the amount of heat that's released or absorbed per gram. If we're talking about condensation or boiling, we're going to use the heat of vaporization. Notice how similar the two equations are. There's no delta T in there. There's just heat and mass and then our heat of fusion or our heat of vaporization. From the sheet that you got in class, there are a few heats of fusion and heats of vaporization listed. It is not necessary to memorize these. Let's look at a sample problem. How much heat is released when 17 grams of steam condenses? Notice how there is no mention of a temperature change, so Q equals MC delta T is out. And also notice this word condenses. That's a phase change. So Q equals M times, and because it's condensation, we're going to use the heat of vaporization. And all we need to do is look up the heat of vaporization for water. Two thousand two hundred and sixty joules per gram, and then when we round our answer, uh, the only piece of data we have to work with is the mass. So we don't use the heat of vaporization or the heat of fusion for significant figures, just like the specific heat capacity. We get thirty-eight thousand four hundred and twenty, and that will be joules. Heat will always be in joules for us. And now, um, there's one little catch here. We're talking about heat that's being released. So we're talking about something that is exothermic. And all we need to do then is add in a little negative sign to show that that heat is being released. If it really bothers you, for all your exothermic phase changes, put a little negative right in front of your heat of fusion or heat of vaporization value. So now you know how to calculate how much heat is released absorbed during temperature changes and phase changes. And you can see it summarized here on this heating curve. Notice for the temperature changes we've got Q equals MC delta T. For our liquid to solid or solid to liquid uh, phase changes, that would be heat of fusion. And for our gas to liquid or liquid to gas phase changes, 
that's going to be our heat of vaporization.